All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest coming to us from the UK. His name is Dorian Linsky, L-Y-N-S-K-E-Y. He recently published just in June, on June 4th a new book titled Ministry of Truth, the biography of George Orwell's 1984. Uh, his preceding book was titled 33 Revolutions Per Minute, A History of Protest Songs. And I think that was published in 2011. And I also recently read an article he posted on LitHub.com. It's titled, We All Really Need to Reread George Orwell's 1984, How the Message of a Book Can Change Radically Over Time. And I definitely agree with that title. And we're going to talk about the book, talk about the influences on Orwell and the book. And uh, I highly recommend this book. So, Dorian, are you there? Yeah. Awesome. Hi, Hi. Well, thank you very much for agreeing to this. So, for people who don't know your name, uh, if you can, just talk a little bit about yourself, how you became interested in this topic, and uh, we can start from there. Uh, okay, we well, started as a, as a journalist in the 90s, um, mainly doing um, music, uh, but also uh, sort of where, you know, wherever possible things that interested me um, films and books sometimes and increasingly quite a lot of politics um particularly after the protest songs book um because obviously it's it's as much about politics as it is about music but i did study uh i did study english at university and and so i've always had this kind of relationship with literature and orwell was um just one of those people who was kind of it was almost too obvious to say that you liked him because he's just such a part of, uh, I mean, British life particularly. So he's always being cited. 1984 is is as famous as a novel can be. Um, and then in 2016, I started becoming interested in, in just trying to um, understand the history of dystopian uh, literature, like where these very familiar tropes come from. If you're writing a dystopian novel now, um, it's sort of there. There are so many obvious kind of cliches that you can draw on and of course you know cliches start somewhere so I was intrigued by that um and and realized that kind of the story of 1984 would be one way of doing that and and as happens I think with a with a good book idea is that it starts drawing in all these other strands all these other things that you're interested in um and while I was working on the proposal which took quite a long time to to pull together um the U.S. election happened uh Trump got in uh, the, the sort of Kellyanne Conway alternative facts phrase right. just sparked right. this immediate revival of interest in 1984. And that and that really sort of confirmed uh, that I was onto something because I thought there must be something kind of in, in the cultural memory that just knows that when certain things happen or certain phrases occur, um, that this is the book that you should turn to, that it's going to be a kind of useful uh, sort of, you know, handbook. And again, I mean, there's very there's very few novels that 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 serve that role. I think maybe The Handmaid's Tale, which we might talk about a bit later, because that was influenced by 1984, um, has has become one of those. But there's very few. And the more that I thought about it, the more um, I know you can't, you can't really be more unique. You're either unique or not unique. But <laughs> I'm just just struck by like how unique um, 1984 is and and how um, how sort of contingent, you know, it, it, its sort of path to, to existence was. I think you know, when something's extremely famous and extremely established, it's always interesting to go back and find out, um, well, what exactly, what, what exactly happened? How might it have been different? What were the factors that needed to line up for this book to, to ever exist in the first place? So maybe that's a great place to start is what your earlier statement was, is that what preceded Orwell? Maybe we can talk about Orwell's past history and uh, what he was known for. I think here in the States, you know, we get 1984 just kind of put on our desks in high school and don't know a lot of that background information about Orwell or Eric Blair himself and the influences upon Orwell. So I suppose the I mean the life and the influences are two are two different things. So I'll just I'll just sort of start with the life is that for a large part of his career and he really didn't start writing 
um, in earnest until his his late twenties and didn't and didn't become known um, and, until his thirties is that he was an increasingly important figure in the fairly small world of um, British uh, literary life and and politics. And so if you were um, a writer and a certain kind of politician on the left in London in the 1930s and early 40s, then you would probably know that Orwell well was interesting. You know, you would have read his you know book reviews in in, in magazines like the New Statesman. Um, uh, but he wouldn't he wouldn't have had any real traction with the general public. I mean, there's books that are well known now, like Down and Out in Paris and London, which was his first book, and The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, Homage to Catalonia, which is his book about the Spanish Civil War, um, which sold a frighteningly small amount. Um, I mean, just a few hundred. So he really wasn't terrible. His novels didn't do very well. Um, and so it really changed with Animal Farm. That was what gave him an audience that was sort of ready for 1984. That was a real surprise. He wrote that in 1943, 44, it came out, 1945 in the UK and 46 in the US. Um, and that was the first time he ever made any serious money from writing. It was the first time that he was really well known outside this small circle. Um, and that almost and that meant, did, yeah, it almost didn't get published, right? I mean, it was rejected by twelve uh, literary houses or something like that. It was rejected in yeah, it was rejected by several people in the UK and the US. Um, mostly, not entirely, but mostly for political reasons, um, because this was well during World War Two. It was a um, a sort of parable about Stalinism and the betrayal of the Russian Revolution, and. You know, Stalin was obviously our ally, but he was he was also being kind of valorized in the press. You know, Life magazine, which was generally um, anti-communist, wrote this gl- did a glowing special issue on on Stalin during the war. Um, you know, Churchill presented him with a kind of specially engraved sword. It was like they they needed him, right. um, and so oh well position was well sure you need him as a military ally but it doesn't mean that you should sort of forgive his crimes which is a very honest position i think that most of us would agree with that now but at the time it was a very politically risky position so you had people turning it down because they didn't want to offend you know the government and then you had people turning it down because they were still sympathetic to stalinism so you had people on the um on the left turning it down for that reason. And then there's one publisher in America that just said books about animals don't sell, um, which I think was probably was quite a relief to him because after all these, after all these really political rejections, that was just like a really <laughs> blunt one. But he was always on the left. Orwell was pretty much stalwart, a stalwart socialist, even though he was, he was seen as kind of like a betrayer for writing this uh, critique of Stalin's, Stalin's Russia, right? Well, he was a very particular kind of figure. He had a kind of political, you know, sort of ideology of one. Um, and that was really, he was a kind of socialist who was annoyed by other socialists. Um, and then when he went to fight in Spain, the end of 36, the first half of 37, he um, fought for a small faction called the Poom, which was kind of an ex-Trotskyist uh, anti-Stalinist group, group, which meant because Stalin was funding the um, most of the Republican forces and the international brigades, um, that that put the Poom in this very small, um, very unpopular, weak position. And in fact, they were persecuted, and some of Orwell's comrades were um, arrested, executed, hounded out of Spain. And he was shocked by that because uh, I, I don't think he, did, he didn't expect the sort of the mistreatment and then the lies about the role of the Poom to be so outrageous because the Stalinists claimed that Poom was working with, with General Franco's fascists, um, which, was, which was completely untrue. And then he was shocked again because he found out that, that, that um, communists elsewhere just repeated these lies and didn't, and didn't challenge them at all. And then when he tried to publish articles or a book um, saying the truth as he saw it, 
people that he had previously worked for, like the New Statesman or his publisher, Victor Golands, because they had Soviet sympathies, just wouldn't publish him. And it was a real shock to him that these people that he was sort of, um, you know, broadly friendly with uh, would just would just go, no, this this is this this truth is is unacceptable to us. And I think it really gave him this sense that his version of socialism was was going to be very individual and it had to be built on these quite old fashioned, you know, these very strong liberal values of kind of, you know, honesty and decency and fair play and that you just couldn't build a better world um, on murder and lies, which again is one of those things that now uh, to most people would seem uncontroversial. But at the time, so many socialists basically thought, well, the only socialist regime in the world is Stalin's Russia. So if we believe in socialism, we must believe in Stalin's Russia and to turn on Stalin would be to kind of dismantle your whole uh you know, political belief system, and Orwell's argument was, but this isn't this isn't really socialism. This is not this will not end well, and this kind of makes a travesty of of of, of your values. Right. And so, so he was very he was made lonely, and he was persecuted to some extent. Yeah. So he was he was definitely kind of a definitely an individualist in that in that circle. And Animal mm-hmm. Farm was uh, really his first financial success, which allowed him to um to actually write 1984 i think warburg his publisher said without animal farm you know without that allowance there would be no 1984 correct yeah i mean i think there's probably you know warburg because he was the one who stepped in and agreed to publish animal farm when no one else would so perhaps he's he's blowing his own trumpet there Mm -hmm. but it's it's a reality that until the money from the american um publication came in and it was kind of a, it was a book of the month club pick. It was a real sensation in, in, in America. That's really where the, the money came from, because there wasn't a lot of money in, in post-war Britain that people spending on books. That was what enabled him to quit freelance journalism. He was a phenomenal freelance journalist. He was writing incredible, lasting work um, on a deadline constantly, but it was also wearing him out. And he, he wanted to write this book desperately. In fact, he sketched out the outline uh, towards the end of 1943 or the beginning of 44. There's a kind of notebook outline of the book that was going to become 1984. And yet he didn't start it, wasn't able to start it for another three years. And so it, I, one of the interesting things about writing at Orwell is because he was a working journalist, um, these things, these practical factors really come into play. It's like he literally, it's like he, he couldn't afford to write the book. Right. right. And it's interesting, too, because it was, it was after the war and after all of these, uh, you know, nightmare at- atmospheres that he lived through, that that timing was very fortuitous, as far as, the, in my opinion, as far as the book writing, because he had lived through the Blitz, the whole thing that went down in Spain, what he called the nightmare atmosphere, where there are people from the NKVD there and all this stuff. So he mm-hmm. had he had absorbed all of these um, very kind of dark situations, and I think that that was reflected in the book. Yeah, almost everything that held him up helped the book. It was like if he'd been able to write the book earlier, there's there's things he wouldn't have experienced, and also crucial books that he wouldn't have read and ideas that he wouldn't have developed. You know, so it's a it's a book that really sort of benefited from this this slow cooking where it took him uh, around five years between thinking of the idea and actually finishing it. Well, that's a great point. Like what other I mean, looking back at all of his stuff, he was very well connected to important people in literature, such as H.G. Wells, who had also uh, written dystopias. But uh, maybe we can talk about some of those influences and the influences from Russia, Darkness at Noon as well. So I suppose the one that would have affected him when he was young was was H.G. Wells. He was just this sort of colossal figure, uh, and I, I don't think there's really any modern comparison for how important Wells was as somebody that started off writing very exciting, um, ideas-driven, but but also just real page-turning science fiction novels, and then decided that he was going to become this important, you know, thinker and historian, and he was incredibly prolific and just wrote so many different kinds of book. 
um, I mean, far more than was, was good for his reputation. And Orwell was very influenced by him as a child and as a teenager was, 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 was interested in writing something like that, a sort of a story of the future. And the first story he had published in a school magazine was actually a kind of Wellesian story of the future. Um, the, the thing about the dystopian and, utop and, dy and utopian novels was that it was a form that sprang entirely out of ideas, political ideas, which is, it's not quite the case now. There's certainly ideas in something like The Hunger Games, but it's not a political essay, you know, with a, with a plot wrapped around it. Um, but at the time, the reason people wrote utopias and anti-utopias was because they wanted to say, well, this is how I think the world should be. Right. right. Um, and Wells... Sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say there was an American, you mentioned Bellamy as well. So there's all of these influential writers that are actually having an impact upon real world events. Well, yeah, that's that I think is a, there was definitely a, a tradition of utopian, particularly utopian socialist literature. And, the, and the Edward Bellamy, this journalist in Massachusetts, published Looking Backward in 1889, which was the second biggest selling book of the 19th century after Uncle Tom's Cabin. I mean, just unbelievably important and read by uh, socialists and anarchists and feminists, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt liked it. Um, British Prime Minister Clement Attlee uh, was inf was influenced by it. It was uh, unbelievably important, and around the world, including like in Russia, it was very popular. And it set off this kind of bizarre wave of of responses. It was almost like now you know, there's an answer song. Well, there's like a no there's a hit, and then you get these kind of novelty responses, and there were there were just tons and tons of responses to to looking backward. Some of which endured, like um, uh, News from Nowhere by William Morris or um, H. G. Wells' The Sleeper of Wakes, which actually mentions Bellamy in the text, so it's obvious where that influence is coming from. So you have kind of Bellamy starting this kind of publishing craze, then you have Wells taking it in a darker direction he sort of wrote utopias and anti-utopias and then wells's influence international influence was colossal and so many of the most important um you know sort of science fiction of the early 20th century was directly a response to wells um and you know there were so so many people around the world writing um responses to arguments with with wells and one of those um, was Yevgeny Zamyatin's book, We, um, which was really important to Orwell. Um, and is probably the, the other sort of early dystopia that's, that, that I would really recommend that people read because it's, it's not easy to read because it's got a very strange sort of modernist poetic style. But it's so compelling. And Zamyatin comes up with and he was writing only a few years after the Russian Revolution. So this is pre-Stalin. This is pre-totalitarianism. But he's talking about a kind of a, re a regimented, uh, you know, proto-totalitarian state with surveillance, um, with a kind of mysterious dictator who who's calls himself the benefactor. Um, and these two kind of rebel lovers. There's, there's a lot of plot aspects even though he had very different ideas to Orwell, there's a lot of plot aspects that, that you can see feeding into 1984. And he was kind of, he was kind of a, a friend of uh, Maxim Gorky, but the book itself was only published outside of Russia at that time. I think you wrote in the book it wasn't published in Russia until 1988 or something like that. Yes, very early on, the, the, uh, the, the Soviet censors realized that... Um, that this was not something that they wanted people to read because Sam Yassin had very particular ideas about revolution and he thought the revolution needed to be um, constant and that you couldn't arrive at a perfect state and you constantly had to be rethinking and changing. And, of course, after the Russian Revolution, the Soviets very much wanted people to think that that, re that was the revolution, that that was the only one that you needed and let's, not, let's preserve that, let's not try and change it again. So it was very... Um, it was a very subversive book, and as the years went on, particularly after Stalin replaced Lenin, Zamyatin just had a had a hell of a time, as I sort of describe in the book. Um, and he really was sort of ostracised and persecuted, and ended up 
personally asking Stalin if he could go into exile because he literally couldn't be published in Russia anymore and he died in, in exile in Paris. And he's a phenomenally uh, brave and stubborn figure, which I think Orwell found quite inspiring. Um, and Orwell read the, Orwell himself did, didn't read the book until the 1940s. Um, but you can definitely see, uh, if you compare the outline of 1984 to the finished novel, the ideas are basically the same. Orwell didn't really change the ideas, but the, the plot points, um, there are a lot of plot points that came in that do seem quite similar to, to we. And so, somebody have made, made, some people have made plagiarism claims based upon that, but um, <clears throat> you don't think those bear out at all, right? I, well, I don't know if you take certain... I, I just, it would depend on what your definition of plagiarism is, that yeah. if you sort of take certain plot points. I mean, if you, if you, like I said, I studied, I studied English literature, and, um, you know, if you're studying Shakespeare and you look at how much of, you know, Hamlet or Macbeth he took from existing plays and history books, um, and you, you could look at the plot and go, oh, my God, he's just, he's just taken the plot. But, of course, what is what we remember Shakespeare for is all of the other sort is what he did, how much, you know, how much he improved it, all the things that he introduced. And so plagiarism is just such, it's such a blunt word. Right, what word. Orwell was doing was just picking up ideas from here and there. But I think, I think what really is important about these early dystopias is what is the philosophy of the writer? And Orwell's philosophy was very different to Zamyatin's and very different from Aldous Huxley and very different from H.G. Wells. Um, and all of these books, even ones that um, become very famous and influential, they're really idiosyncratic. Nobody but Orwell could have written 1984. Right. No and you, but Huxley could have written the you world, know. you know. Right. So Huxley was actually not merely just an influence upon Orwell. He was tutoring Orwell at Eton, correct? He did briefly. He had a unhappy period as a, as a teacher at Eton. Um, this was pre Break New World. And Orwell sort of first encountered him there. And then when he read Brave New World, he was quite sort of, he liked it, but not that much. He thought, he thought that um, Huxley hit some of the right targets, but then ignored others. Um, and that was very much Orwell's way, was that the people that he, the writers and thinkers that he most admired were also the ones that he would be harshest about. So there was some, you, you read some of the stuff that he wrote about age wells it's pretty brutal and at the same time he would say that wells did more to sort of shape his young mind than than any other writer and so there's a similar kind of argument going on with huxley that he was obviously really interested but it was it's in the disagreement that you get the inspiration to do your own thing yeah, that's why it's such a kind of spiky dynamic form um is that is that so many you know, some really great dystopias. And E.M. Forster did one called The Machine Stops, which is, seems very prescient now. It <laughs> almost seems to predict the internet uh, by, by accident. Um, and he, he really wrote that because he was just annoyed by H.G. Wells. And being annoyed by H.G. Wells turned out to be incredibly uh, inspiring for a, lot of, for a lot of writers. Right, not just Orwell himself. I mean, I think, what was it, Wells, Hitler, and the World State, where he's criticizing yeah. Wells' view... So I think the inclusion of these essays into uh, the book or referencing them was great because it's not something that I was really that aware of. But you can see that Orwell is still really a, uh, has the, his finger on the pulse of his time up until those books, both, you know, uh, Animal Farm and 1984 written. So he's, he was very and he and then he and Wells had a falling out. So he has this uh, clearly kind of a, a rivalry type feeling with some of these other authors. It's like it's a bit like like an Oedipal thing that he was kind of, that to him, Wells represented, and he was very unfair to Wells, but he was right that Wells was from a different generation. In the same way that Wells was from a different generation to Jules Verne, uh, and therefore his science fiction was much darker. Um, by comparison, you know, Wells' science fiction didn't seem dark enough to Orwell. It's just like he just seemed far too optimistic. And so we all had this very complicated relationship with the sort of, the people that came up at the end of the Victorian era, um, who had this, including, you know, he never really wrote about Edward Bellamy, but Edward Bellamy would be in this category of 
people that really had these grand schemes for sort of improving society and, and humankind, this real kind of utopian impulse. And Orwell writing in the 1930s and 40s was like, well, this hasn't worked out at all, has it? Right. You know, you must, have, you must have missed something about human nature, uh, you know, because look what's happened instead. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, so he yeah, had seen the just total wreckage of World War II. Um, and I think Orwell himself, when he was, he was actually paid to go and follow the troops and went to Cologne and actually saw the rubble of Germany after it had been, you know, destroyed either by bombing or invasion. So, you know, those things are, are those are probably made a very potent impression. Yes. Yeah. Basically, what Orwell was able to do was to, was to take quite a um, quite a limited experience and kind of squeeze every drop of juice out of it. And so his only experience of living in a police state was, you know, a couple of weeks towards the end of his time in Spain when when the Stalinists had really sort of taken over uh, Barcelona. But he remembered that mood of fear and paranoia and suspicion and similarly, he, you know, he only spent a couple of weeks in post-war Germany. But that really stuck with him, this kind of this absolute kind of desolation and defeat. And he was just able to preserve that intensity of emotion and observation. And there's so much in 1984. And the reason why I think it makes such a big impact on people, even before they're kind of sort of often mature enough to kind of absorb all the ideas, is there's a real visceral sense of place and of of what you're seeing and hearing and smelling and and you know he spent most of his time in in england so he was really just he was really taking a hell of a lot from these quite short experiences elsewhere that's yeah, interesting but also some of the eeriness of one of the things about orwell that's different than wells and some of these other guys is he did not equate i think you wrote never equated technology with progress which is interesting because all these other figures and these utopia science was going to save the day, but he he had a, a much more alternate view. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the, the reasons why you know the book has, has has sort of come to feel more relevant again in in recent years because I think if you if you look at the way that people were talking about the internet in the nineties, uh, that was quite Wellsian. It was like there will be kind of you know, infinite sunlight and there will be no place for lies to hide and everybody will be communicating um, openly and, you know, regimes won't be able to control their citizens because their citizens will have this the network that they can use. Um, and of course, that turns out not to um, that not to not to be the case. And that there's there's all these ways in which um, in which the Internet and devices can be used to um, make a regime more oppressive. And, you know, China's the, the prime example of that now. Right. Right. So, so yeah, there were certain kind of... Um, the, and they really were, again, quite idiosyncratic sort of biases on Orwell's part. He was very... Um, he, he wasn't really into technology. He wasn't really into, like, new things. He didn't like sort of modern furniture or tinned food. Tin food is a huge obsession for writers of the 30s. They just thought it was awful. Um, there are all these, and he was very suspicious of kind of radio and aeroplanes. There's a wonderful line where it just goes, you know, well, look, you know, aeroplanes are now mainly used to drop bombs. You know, radio is used to pump out propaganda. All these things that people thought would just kind of lead us to a higher plane have, in fact, been used to do the same sort of things that, uh, you know, the Spanish Inquisition would have done had they had the tools. And this is. This is a world's great insight into technology. It's not the specifics of technology. He doesn't really explain the technology in the world of 1984. It, it, was, it was beyond, it was absolutely beyond him to actually explain how the telescreen would work. He, he wasn't, Wells was kind of, he trained as a scientist. He was quite a kind of a scientific brain. Orwell didn't. But what he did understand was how power uses technology. So it was almost a given for him that whatever new technology comes along, Power will find a way to abuse it, right? And, and he, that's could, a, he had firsthand in uh, firsthand experience with that as somebody who was working for. He was hired by the BBC, I think, during the war to 
prop out, you know, pump out propaganda for, I think it was Free India or India. He would, he had some kind of office there, right? It was for the, um, yeah, he was working for the, the Indian section of the Eastern Service. Um, it was a very, very soft form of, of propaganda. It was really the kind of, uh, we, we call it like soft power, where the idea is to um, present uh, the best of Western the best of Western culture, the best of sort of liberal democratic culture. So mostly he was talking about, you know, his favourite novels and poems and, you know, doing radio plays and panel discussions. Um, but what he did study was was real propaganda um, because he would be listening to Nazi propaganda and sort of studying how that worked. And, he, you know, he realised that this was nothing like what the BBC was doing. It was like... <laughs> You had to, you almost you had to be a totalitarian regime to do propaganda like as thoroughly as that. So he kind of was both he was both sort of, you know he was kind of a propagandist, but in in not really not in a way that we would that we would recognise now. I mean that you know it's propaganda in the way say the BBC World Service, which is simply broadcasting general interest programmes all around the world, and I suppose it makes the BBC and Britain you know, look like a very positive force. Gotcha. But it's not telling anybody what to think or, or you know, pumping out particular, pumping out lies. But, I mean, you do write that that introduced him to all these themes that are in 1984. Propaganda, bureaucracy, <laughs> censorship, mass media, these elements that are in the Ministry of Truth. So, I mean, I think that... No, absolutely. It was incredibly useful because he, he, he learned... He, you know, he learned about things by you know, by reading, but also particularly by doing them. And just to be part of it, you know, you can't understand a big corporate bureaucracy unless you've worked in it for a bit. Um, you can't really understand censorship until you've you've seen that process in action. And so he was, even though he kind of constantly grumbled about his work at the BBC, one, he created a lot of really good work there, and two, it gave him all these insights. That, that he took into 1984. I don't think it's a coincidence that he wrote the outline for 1984, basically the month that he left the BBC. Oh, interesting. And I, I found it an interesting note that his boss was Guy Burgess, one of the Cambridge Five. That was uh, really something else. So this, this guy who literally is working for the Soviets was his boss. Well, well, that 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 shows how kind of like relatively uh, loose. Um, you know the BBC was that they that they they had this sort of Soviet spy in their midst. There was nothing. Um, I think some people made the mistake because he took certain visual details and memories uh, from the BBC and put them into 1984. That in some way the Ministry of Truth was meant to be the BBC. And one thing that he learned it was like the BBC was not remotely capable, um, and and no kind of broadcast in a democracy was capable of being um, of being the Ministry of Truth. Gotcha. And you mentioned uh, Mar- Margaret Atwood, and she uh, she was uh, she had some kind of appendix theory about the book too. She wrote The Handmaid's Tale, which is very present. I don't know when was she a contemporary of Orwell. She remembered reading. She was born during World War Two, oh, okay. maybe just before, um, and she was. Um, she was just fascinated by Orwell as a as a child, um, and then when she came to write *The Handmaid's Tale*, which was probably coincidentally, because she'd been thinking about it for a while, but she started writing it in the year 1984 in West Berlin, so it was a very apt place to start writing it. Um, she, you know, she obviously introduces a ton of ideas and a quality of writing that wasn't present in Orwell. But there are certain nods to him throughout the text. And the biggest one is her appendix where, um, you know, Hamay's tale is, is, is a diary, is Offred's diary. Okay, gotcha. And then at the end, we get this appendix from uh, these academic, an academic conference in the far future where they're all discussing it. And you realize they've called it the Handmaid's Tale as like a little academic in-joke. And Offred never called it that. And so it's this really odd ending um because it puts the ho- it basically says gilead fell you know it's her way of creating uh sort of some sense of hope 
that maybe Offred died, but Gilead fell. Gotcha. And she, t- she got that idea from her reading of the appendix in 1984, which one way of reading that and making sense of it is that it could only have been written by somebody after uh, Ingsoc fell. And therefore, even though Winston Smith was defeated, the regime did not last forever. So for her, and there's no, you can honestly argue it either way. There's that, there's no, nothing that Orwell ever wrote or said which, which confirms it or denies it. But it's a very potent, um, it's a very potent theory with quite a lot of fans. Thomas Pynchon's, you know, a, a big fan of the appendix theory as well. And it's a nice way of, of complicating the book at the very end. You're just like, well, what is this appendix? Who wrote it? What does it mean about the, the text that you've just been reading? Yeah, that's an interesting point. And then there was also whether the two plus two, whether the inclusion of the five or not, that was also, <laughs> I think you wrote that in some places it wasn't added. So you don't know when you read the book whether two plus two equals four or two plus two equals five. And again, I mean, that's something that there is just, there's no hard evidence for why that happened, why the, the five dropped out of that in, I think it was the second edition, and then remained that way into the into the 80s. So that was the edition that the, the Michael Radford's 1984 movie was based on, because that was the only edition that, you know, that anyone was reading. And so he was quite surprised that it was actually meant to be five. He was like, oh, that's too bleak. There has to be this ambiguity that maybe you know, Winston hasn't been completely crushed. And, but I think the evidence... Sorry, please continue, sorry. sorry. No, please continue, sorry. Yeah, but I think, I think that the... Um, I don't think that you... I think the most interesting thing about it is not, okay, exactly what happened to this missing five, but what it says about readers, um, like, that in this book, that so much has been... So much hangs on this equation by the very end and hangs on what you think uh, Orwell um, was was trying to say and if there's any hope for Winston. And I personally don't think that you need the hope there. I'm quite happy for it to be that he's, he is totally defeated. Um, I think that, that really, that really fits Orwell's agenda, but I'm intrigued by the fact that so many people seize on this tiny thing, which may just be a typographical error uh, as kind of like a glimmer of hope, because it just shows really how powerful this book is. That that, that some people really, really need that that hope, and, and other people don't. Right. Um, and well, again, I think that thing it puts it in quite a unique position. I, I just find it fascinating that of all the typographical errors you could make, there's no spelling mistakes, but that that incredibly significant number just goes missing in the second edition. And I mean, um, one one of the oddities about the book too is it really was his last last uh, book published. I mean, he died what two hundred and twenty days after the publication of nineteen eighty four. So there's never was really a chance to actually ask the writer what he meant. So it's almost like this bookend to his life. And you have this position that not all Orwell scholars or researchers have that he actually didn't think he was going to pass away that he was planning on uh you know living for another 10 or 15 years well if you look at the way that he the things that he said and the way that he behaved um it it all suggests this real kind of sort of fierce determination to keep living and it was one of the reasons that he got married to his second wife sonia um because he thought that would give him something to live for He, he he seemed to sort of believe he said it it, you know, sort of semi-flippantly, but also sort of seemed to believe that if you had lots of ideas for books, if you're a writer, you had lots of ideas for books, if you had lots to live for, and he had, so he had a new wife, he had an adopted son, he had um, this huge popularity, he had all these ideas for what he wanted to write next. And I think he did believe that well, you, you, you can't die if you've got all of this, all of this stuff to live for. And he certainly didn't think that he was dying when he wrote it. And I think one of the great myths around 1984 is that the bleakness comes from the fact that he was that he was dying. Um, and and of course, yes, he was very ill. But then there were phases when he wasn't ill. And, and many people, uh, you know, you can be very, very ill, but you don't die. So therefore, 
people don't say they were dying. Do, do, you, do you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. And people might have absolutely. cancer and, and really believe that they are very close to death, but they don't die. And so that doesn't then become the narrative that they would. So it's just because Orwell did die. It doesn't mean that all the way through the writing of this book, he was like, this is going to happen. And I, I think, I don't think, I don't think that's uncommon either. I think most people, you know, when they're very ill, they, they do think, Oh, well, I'll just pull out of this. It's his problem was that because he was so determined to finish the book on Jura, this remote Scottish Island with no hospital, um, that he kind of jeopardized his chances of recovery in order to finish the book. Right. Uh, yeah. so effectively, he, he effectively, you could argue he made that trade off. And so we're at about 40 minutes. I mean, there's so much more. I feel like we've covered a, just a small part of all the information you've put into this book. There's the, you broke the book into two parts. The second part is we, we covered what led up to 1984, but the second part covers its influence upon the latter part of the 20th century into the 21st century. Is there anything else that, sorry about that. Is there anything else that you would like to add or anything I missed? Anything you'd like to finish up with? Well, I suppose part two, um, was just to the the idea there where there's this four chapters was to just show what the book meant in different eras in the decade. So it's the fifties, the seventies, the eighties and the 21st century. And in each time period, different things were important about the book. Different people were trying to claim the book politically, uh, different art forms were, um, were, were being influenced by it. You know, it, it took sort of, till the 1980s, really, for like, with Viva Vendetta, for like a comic book to be strongly influenced by 1984. Um, you know, maybe it took a long enough gap for Terry Gilliam's Brazil to be an 80s version, an 80s, not version, but an 80s riff on the world of 1984. And so I was intrigued by this idea that, of, of, of really asking why does it, like, everyone always just go, well, it's still relevant, it's more relevant than ever. Um, but I kind of wanted to ask, well, well why? Because relevance is not a constant it doesn't just start relevant and remain relevant it has to keep evolving and most books are essentially making one point so at various points in in history it's just that point is not you know that germane but there's so much in 1984 so even in the you know even in the late 80s when the soviet union was was falling apart um, and so totalitarianism, which is a huge part of the book, was not really the sort of clear and present danger. People just turned to technology and said, "Ah, oh, but you know what? What might people? What you know? What might future regimes do with um, with computers?" Or they turned to the language and, "Oh, look at the way that politicians use Orwellian language." And so it's there's always something there that even in its kind of even when it's not relevant in one respect, it's relevant in another. Right. And it's always sparking ideas in, in, in one way or another. It's just so deeply embedded in the culture. And the problem is, I think, when something is so famous that everybody thinks that they know it, um, it becomes misunderstood. And, you know, I, I, there are certain quotes that, that, that I think I put in an I put them in an essay for pals, like just these quotes that you see going around Twitter that uh, attributed to Orwell. It's like, nope, he never said that. And he never would have said that because the language is not language that he would have used at that particular time. You know, there's, that's, that is, again, a very unusual thing is that, that, that people are always trying to claim Orwell. And I thought it was really important in the book to say, well, you know, you can you can you can say what you like about him. You can claim what you like. But this is what he did. This is what he wrote. This, as far as I can tell, is what he thought. Um, and, and you should at least try and at least have some knowledge of that before describing the things as, you know, as Big Brother or the Thought Police or tweeting quotes that he never said, you know, because right. he was a real stickler. Right. He was a real stickler for getting things right. He, re he really, really was. And if he made mistakes... He would apologize for them and he would point them out and go, well, this is why I made this mistake. And so I thought the kind of the, the duty that I owed or anyone really should owe to him is to at least get right what what he said, 
what he did um, and not just and not just make this kind of make his memory and make the, the reputation of the book the sort of malleable thing. And right. so if I see someone like, you know, Infowars citing Orwell, that's, uh, you know, that's that's the world turned upside down. <laughs> that's just like it's just like it's 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 outrageously um, it's outrageously wrong. But again, you know, that's sort of the price of being uh, as famous as a book can be. Yeah. Is, I mean, uh, is there any it. is there any rival in the 20th century that may be as important? I mean, I don't know. As far as a fictional science fiction movie, uh, book, I think Not, every high school student in the U.S. reads it. I don't think there's one politically. I mean, I think generally if you're talking about a kind of trove of reference points uh, that make sense to people who don't even know the original source, you sort of have to turn to like Star Wars Yes. And Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, to an extent you could say like uh, The Matrix is obviously something that's had a real a real kind of impact on kind of the, right. on, the, on the language. Language as well, right? Uh, all the terms and all these concepts that Orwell added. The Matrix is right. probably just the same. As so well. The Matrix, you know, the kind of, sort of red pill idea is is equivalent to one of Orwell's things, but most of most of these books they have they have one. They've sort of given the world this one phrase or this one idea. But the fact with Orwell is you can start listing them and go, okay, Big Brother, Thought Police, The Memory Hole, Room One Hundred and One, Room One Hundred and One, Ministry of Truth, Room One Hundred and One, The Ministry of Truth. It's like unperson, so yeah, many of them. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think there's anything that that, that 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 can compare, even though something obviously like the, you know, the Handmaid's Tale. Right now, it's extremely, um, is extremely resonant. Yes, um, and part of the culture. Protesters will, you know, dress in the red and white, and people can people will use the word Gilead, and everybody kind of gets what that's referring to. Right. So it's sort of it's close. There's a lot of things that you can go. Oh, okay. Or the V for Vendetta mask. You know, there's lots of things yes. that have made an impact on our political language and iconography, but there's nothing that has done so many things for so long it's very true that's very true uh so it's dorian linsky where can people are you on social media if people want to contact you do you have uh any social media or email or anything so on, on twitter i'm just i'm just dorian linsky dorian linsky it's just my name gotcha l y n s k e y and can people get the book through you it's all available on amazon right now correct it's all available on amazon or at, uh your local bookstore or as they say you know wherever good books are sold Gotcha. Um, so, so yes. Awesome. Again, uh, the, the title of the book is Ministry of Truth, the biography of George Orwell's 1984 by Dorian Linsky, published June 4th, 2019. Thank you so much. Excellent book and a great conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks. Me too. Okay. Bye, Dorian. Have a good one.